So this week is marking the end of our meditation course. It's less of a course and more of a time to try and put the emphasis on meditation so that even those of you, I know some of you here, have been meditating much longer than I have. But even for those people, it's nice to make a certain period of time when you really put in the effort or a determination that you're going to keep up a regular practice. Keeping up a practice in this way is a very beautiful thing and it starts to take on its own steam. And for that to work, it needs to be regular. You need to do something every day to keep it going. And one of the ways that we do this is marking the difference between religion and meditation, or Buddhism and meditation, because they're not quite the same thing. And as a religion, we have this goal or idea of enlightenment, something that the saints and sages, the mystics and the hermits have tried have stumbled upon through one way or another, some means or other, either by accident or sometimes by following a particular teaching or sometimes just through bizarre circumstance. So various people have come to this enlightenment and one of the qualities of it is that it's ineffable. And ineffable means it cannot be described, it cannot be put into words. Words and sentences have a way that we can attribute qualities to something. This is something that Aristotle or the Thai philosopher Ali Satotan <laughs> <laughs> discovered. And this is when he taught logic, the logical system, categorical logic. Which means, if you have a chair, we cannot say what a chair is, we can only say what, a, what category a chair belongs to. So a chair belongs to the category furniture, but a chair is not the same as furniture, etc. A cat, a tiger is a kind of cat, but not all cats are tigers. So this was a system of categories. And what it means is that language has this mechanism whereby it can only attribute qualities to something. It can never say what something actually is. So this is what happens when we come to enlightenment. We cannot say exactly what it is. There are certain qualities to it. For example, there can be no more suffering arising. It's an interesting one. No more self, no more birth and death. There is interesting criteria that we can put on it, mostly in terms of what is not there rather than what is there. So this thing that is discovered, this unconditioned, how does one attain to it? What do you do? Well, some of the qualities of enlightenment, the main qualities in fact, are it does not arise, it does not cease, it does not change, and it does not pass away. Now I'm getting hyper-philosophical here. Something that does not arise, does not change, does not cease, does not pass away. Well, what can you possibly do to attain it? Because whatever attainment that is that you've made has just arisen, right? And if that experience has just arisen, well then, it's just an experience that's going to last for a while and pass away. So there's always a trap with all the people that have discovered enlightenment. Is when they say, hey, there's this really cool thing that I've discovered, I mean, it's really good, no more suffering, yay. <laughs> and people say, fine, how do I do it? And they say, well, you can't do anything. Because doing something, that's something that's just arisen, lasting and passing away. And you say, well, if I can't do something, what do I do? You say, well, 
you don't do anything. I said, well, I don't do anything every Saturday morning, but I don't get enlightened. So they're always in this trap of words. How do you describe the experience? Most importantly, how do you open up a path for other people to follow so they can attain to the same thing? Which is a key philosophical point in Buddhism because many religions you are not able to attain to the same thing as the teacher. Yet the Buddha was very clear that the thing that he had attained to, absolutely everybody can attain to, to the same level. Enlightenment is not different between different people. There is a difference of the character that is left over, but I'll we'll talk about that later or another day if you wish. So, how can these teachers bring their disciples to attain to that thing? And this is where the teaching of a Buddha is different to a teaching of an ordinary person, because a Buddha has the charisma, has the leadership, I think has the public speaking abilities to put the, to open up a pathway for other people to follow. And a pathway for people to follow implies that they are going to have to do something. And there are certain things you can and should do, and there are certain things that you should not do. Put another way, there are certain things that lead you closer and certain things that lead you further away. So when these teachers speak from an enlightenment perspective and they say, well, there's nothing to do, there's nowhere to go, there's nothing to gain. Or they say things like, you're already enlightened, which clearly you're not. If you're already enlightened, then you don't have to pay the fees, so that's not very common. But clearly you're not already enlightened, and clearly there is something that you have to do. So the teaching of a Samma, Sambuddha, one who is fully enlightened, is distinctive in that they open up a path, and they're able to point out that there are certain qualities that should be developed, and there are certain qualities that should be let go of. Very broadly, we would say, skillful qualities are to be developed and unskillful qualities are to be abandoned. And it's very clear, this word abandoned is not let it be there, let it arise in the mind, just pay attention to it and be mindful of it, which is the way many Vipassana teachers especially but kind of teach. The Buddha is very clear, it was abandoned. The word was pahana, which means to cut off, to destroy, to exterminate, to eliminate. And it's said to be like a tree that has been cut off at the roots. That tree is going to die. Unlike a tree that you cut off at the top or in the middle, the tree will still carry on growing. He said, well, there are certain qualities that need to be eliminated, abandoned. And there are certain qualities that need to be developed, nurtured and cherished. No, they're not enlightenment itself, but they will take you closer. So this is what we are doing with the meditation, is we are developing certain qualities. There are different qualities to develop. Qualities like loving-kindness is a very quiet state of mind, in that if you have this great loving-kindness, there's really nowhere left for the mind to go. It kind of takes you towards this stopping still. Compassion, sympathetic joy, equanimity, these are all states that tend towards quiet, tend towards wakefulness. Greed, on the other hand, tends towards obsession, tends towards you getting more caught up in the machinations of the mind. It's very hard to be greedy without thinking. Have you ever tried it? <laughs> This is why I was talking about Dhamma Vijaya a couple of weeks ago, that if those times come when you want to investigate something, the way to investigate things with meditation 
is to allow it to be there, but not to get caught up in it, not to allow the mind to be absorbed in it. Then you can see greed without thinking, and it doesn't last very long. It's very hard to stay greedy without thinking about the thing you are greedy for. It's really difficult. So it's very difficult to be greedy when you're not thinking. Greed will tend towards pulling you into these machinations of the mind, things that arise and cease. Hatred or disliking, it's very difficult to really be in aversion and dislike to something if you don't think about it. It lasts for a little while. This person annoys you, this traffic annoys you, this weather you don't like, or you're feeling sick. It lasts for a little while, but it's very, if you don't keep that spinning top spinning quite quickly, it kind of falls off. Delusion is the same. Delusion is being caught up in stories, nonsense stories. From conversations, TV series are the most obvious so easy to get caught up in a TV series. Get lost in the story and the expectation. I've weaned myself off it, mostly, but I still have a few things that remain. Judge Judy. I, uh, <laughs> it's just nonsense, but we absolutely love nonsense. So we love stories, um, but stories again will suck you into those machinations, those movements of the mind. And as you said, the unconditioned or enlightenment is something that isn't the movement of the mind, it doesn't arise, doesn't cease, doesn't change. So we have to disentangle ourselves from all that stuff that sucks your attention in. So all the different qualities that lead towards this disentangling from things are qualities that are worth developing. All the qualities that lead to more entanglement, these are qualities that should be abandoned. And so the Buddha's word for meditation was bhavana, which means to develop. Very interesting, right? Enlightenment is not something you can develop not something you can nurture, not something that arises or ceases. But the Buddha said your entire practice is a practice of development. There are certain qualities that you must develop. So, the process of entanglement, entanglement in the things of the world, and the process of disentanglement, which is what we're doing when we're sitting, which is why anything that arises into experience, you make a note, well, what is that thing that's arisen in experience? And you wait for it to cease. Over time, you get the sense of yourself separate to all the ideas and things that come up. I like this word process, or process if you're American. Process, doing watching process, process. And this is one of the key teachings, certainly, that we do in the monasteries. It's because we don't divide the world into good and bad and nice and wrong and beautiful. And what we do is we look at process. When something arises as an experience in the moment, if you buy into it, if you feed it, you, this whole process arises, the arising of the world. So you, I was looking at these rats the other day. I really want a pet rat. They're really nice. <laughs> and they do all kinds of tricks and things, and they're really smart and intelligent. And I was watching these just, just as a variation on cat videos. I was watching rat videos. And then I really wanted one. Well, what's happening is this is an experience that has arisen, and now I'm buying into it. I like it and I dislike it. Because of liking and disliking, I start desiring and not desiring. Because of desiring to get or desiring to get rid of, I get attachment. Because of attachment, I get this whole state of being around this thing. Because of this state of being, I start projecting into the future and projecting from the past. This whole 
me self world catapults into this big fireworks show. But if I stop feeding with thoughts, what happens? The whole thing just. Phew. This is what the Buddha called the seeing the arising of the world and the ending of the world. He said, if you have seen the arising of the world, you cannot say it isn't real. And if you've seen the cessation of the world, you cannot say the world is real. Yeah. Philosophically, this is quite nice statement. Remember Robert Persig, Zen in the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance? I always want to say mechanics. And one of the things that triggered his experience is he'd been studying Indian philosophy and he was with an Indian philosophy, philosophy teacher who had said that everything is maya, everything is illusion. And he thought to himself, well, was the atom bomb that was dropped on Japan, was that illusion? He said, that's nonsense. And he quit all of his studies of Indian philosophy at that time. So according to the Buddha, no, the, the arising of the world is just as real as the cessation of the world. What he's pointing to is that we watch this process. We watch this process as you buy into something, the whole big fireworks show comes up and it all gets very important to you and you start laying out all these plans and neuroses and fears and then you have a character and then you have to fix the character and my character has too much greed and is too jealous and then you need to see a psychoanalyst and they will expand and fill in all the blanks until you have this great big folder and they say, there you are, this folder is you. And then you have to fix all the stuff in your folder. It gets all very complicated. When the Buddha is talking about watching process, what it means is you watch how this whole thing arises. And then you watch how it all just collapses in on itself. The analogy was like a vine and vines have a distinctive feature that they can be huge, but they have very little root. And so, especially if you go along the canals in Bangkok, you'll see there's old houses and old boats that have been covered with vines. And the vine has covered the entire structure until you can't see any of the original structure at all. And in some cases, the original house or boat has actually long since rotted and disappeared. But the vine just kind of hangs there in the air. So it is that our views and thoughts and opinions go and cover this world. So we create this world. And this whole created world that we have and carry around with us and worry about is not held up by anything. So if you cut the vine at the right point, the whole thing comes tumbling down. So this was the, the Buddha's own analogy. He used this analogy very often, but I liked it in uh, Hung Po, he's one of the Zen masters. And in the opening chapters of his main small book, uh, he talks about this vine, a creeper of views and opinions, he calls it that's covered the world. One small chop and the whole thing comes crashing down. So this is what we're doing with the meditation, is we are developing the certain qualities that lead to or encourage this ending of the whole process. But what happens is you're so accustomed to having these ideas, thoughts, views and opinions and worries and aspirations that you're like you're addicted. So as soon as you get a second of peace from it all, there's almost a panic. Like, what do I do now? Where am I now? If I've disappeared. And so you rapidly try to find something to fill in that void. Yet that void is the way that we are heading. That emptiness is the way that we are, thing that we are trying to develop. Actually, the more you just give up and relax into it, the Pali word was abandon. 
abandon, or I like the word surrender. What you surrender into it. This whole arising, this dance of the world as it comes up in front of you, it gets less and less enticing. And those moments where everything settles down, where the vine comes crashing down, you're just left empty and free. Very beautiful state of mind. So, how do we keep this dance of the world up in front of us? This is what we call the commentator. And the commentator is a little voice in your head that has a commentary on everything that you do. And he's not a very nice person. I'm using he as in the he or she variant. Because they're very unreliable. And this is the voice that tells you, oh, I, I'm not, I need to have lots of money. American dream, dream big. Attain your dreams, work hard. And this little voice will tell you that this is important and you have to do it. This is the voice that tells you you're not good enough. This is the voice that tells you you're going to die. This is the voice that tells you that you're going to make a cup of tea after you've already gotten up to go and make the cup of tea. Have you ever noticed that? Very often when you're doing something, the voice says, okay, I'm going to go and do this. But it always tells you after you already started to do the thing. So my example is a cup of tea. I regularly find myself halfway to the kettle and this little voice says, I'm going to make a cup of tea. And I stop and think, I was already on my way to make the cup of tea. This little voice came in after the event and starts to claim I'm doing it. It's not doing any of it. I started to wonder how much can I do in the world without this commentator always being there telling me what I'm doing. The commentator is not nice. They'll say things like, you really, 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 really need to eat that entire tub of ice cream. <laughs> and then you eat it and it says, I wouldn't have done that if I were you. <laughs> totally unreliable. Switches this way and that way. But because the voice always tells you that that's you, it seems to have a consistency. But when you listen to this commentator in the mind, it's feeding you all kinds of nonsense. I need this, I want that, I can't stand this person, I can't do this, I must have that. You don't need to believe it. This is one of my best insights that I had with meditation was, I don't need to believe this commentator in my mind. The commentator or the thinking has two kinds, two kinds of thinking that we experience in meditation. One is the deliberate thinking. And this means that you are, have a particular topic or a subject that you are thinking about that's coming up and grabbing your attention. So right now these Last few weeks I'm thinking about the videos and getting the videos up and taking the videos and how to... I want to figure out how to pipe that amplifier into that camera. So I'm going to do that today. I bought a load of connectors, I'm going to try and do it. So this is a particular story that I have. And this can come up to me, especially in meditation, and then I will deliberately be thinking about it. There's a particular story and a particular topic. This is called prompted thinking, prompted thinking. You might say deliberate thinking, or deliberation even. The second form of thinking is non-prompted, which means the thinking that is just diffuse and scattered, and it bounces here and it bounces there, and it's like, oh, I want to pipe my sound into my camera, I've got the connectors, maybe I need some more connectors, maybe I can go on Wednesday, but on Wednesday I really wanted to go to this other place and I want to see my friend. I wonder how my friend is. My friend was like this last week. I wonder how he is this week. And, and just from one thing to another thing, to another thing, to another thing. There's no story there. Did you ever try and bring attention to this kind of thinking? Try getting a pen and paper, having a little alarm that goes every 30 seconds and you write down what it was. 
but you give your mind freedom just to bounce anywhere it likes to bounce to. In the space of 10 minutes, you can think of 500 things. You know? When you look back at your list, I can't believe I was even thinking about that. I've totally forgotten that I was thinking about that. Thinking seems so real when you're in it. But when you turn your attention around onto the thinking itself, it's really an imposter. It's an imposter that says it's you, but it's not. So the question arises then, what are you when you're not thinking about you? What are you when you're not thinking about stuff? This is a really nice question to ask. What if I don't think about stuff? There's just silence and there's emptiness. The more you go into that silence and the emptiness, the more the thinking seems like an imposter when it arises. The more the silence and the emptiness feels like actually your home, feels like what you are. This gives you a lot of encouragement because it means you don't have to be anything. You don't have to be a particular kind of person, which is a big relief to me. <laughs> Somebody said to me a while back, he said, I don't feel that you are a person of great compassion. And I thought to myself, I'm not, you can bog off. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have to be a person of great compassion. I don't have to be like the Dalai Lama. I could look at the Dalai Lama and say, I like, I like this about him, I like this, and I'm going to try my best to be like him. Is that going to work? Did the Dalai Lama ever sit down and say, I'm going to be this particular way? That's just another ego trip thing. You are what you are. The most beautiful thing of this kind of practice is you can leave alone what you are. Leave your character alone. Yes, it is useful to develop your character, to develop good traits. So sure, you should be trying to develop the compassion side of you more than you develop the TV watching, political infighting, sports watching kind of person. You know, the, the characters, that side of the character. There's good aspects to the character worth developing and other aspects that are not. But the beautiful thing is this practice is when you put down that entire commentator, when, every, when the whole world ceases, you absolutely don't have to be anything at all. And the curious thing is the more you spend doing that, the more your actual character starts to come right and starts to fix itself. I think of it like when a person gets married in England, and I think America, but I'm not sure about other countries, when they get married and they drive off in the car, you tie a string with tin cans behind the car, right? And it makes a big loud clattering noise. That's how I think of the character clattering behind your meditation. It's a kind of a lot of noise, but actually doesn't make that much difference to the car and the direction. So developing this part of the or awareness of when everything ceases, that's how we start to turn around and come towards this unconditioned nature of the mind. And this is why the Buddha was a Samma Sambuddha, because he not only says, well, there is this enlightenment, but he says there are these certain things you can develop. There are these certain perceptions that you can develop. The perception of suffering will disentangle you more than the perception of things that you like. The perception of impermanence will disentangle, disentangle you more than the perception of permanence. So certain perceptions are worth developing and increasing. So with all this said, I have three stages of mindfulness. This is my own three stages. So the first level of mindfulness meditation is when you are fully present for what you are doing. That means your mindfulness is not scattered around and thinking about this and that, but is firmly based in the present moment 
awareness with the thing that you are doing. So a very typical exercise for this is to do mindful eating. And sometimes I do this, I get, I got those Ferro Rocher and I gave everyone a Ferro Rocher and we all sat here with our eyes closed and mindfully ate the Ferro Rocher. I haven't done that this year because they're a bit expensive, but... <laughs> so something like eating, well, you can be aware of the desiring, you can be aware of the salivation, you're picking it up, putting it into the mouth, how many times you chew. Ajahn, what's his name, Sayadaw Upandita used to say to people when they're eating, how many times did you chew that last mouthful of food? And if you couldn't answer, he'd say, you're not mindful. <laughs> how many footsteps did you take to come to this meditation interview? I don't know, you're not mindful enough. So being mindful of the thing that you are doing is the first step. So if you're walking to the SkyTrain station, you be make sure your attention is bound tightly with the walking to the SkyTrain station. If you're eating your food, make sure your attention is tightly bound to just eating your food. The Buddha called this attention of small movements. He said, when you stand up, you know clearly you're standing up. When you sit down, you know clearly you are sitting down as a process. When you're urinating, you know clearly that you are urinating. When you're washing the bowl, you know clearly that you are washing the bowl. When you're donning the robe, you know clearly you are donning the robe and so on and so forth. So this is a very good exercise to tie your attention down. But there is a delusion in that exercise, which I hope you can spot. That delusion is, well, why are you tying your attention to that particular part of your experience? If, for example, I'm chewing my mouthful of Ferro Rocher and I'm bringing my attention to that, Am I focusing on the jaw, or am I focusing on the taste? If I'm focusing on the jaw and the taste, what about the feeling of my buttocks on the floor, or I'm not focusing on that? What about the sounds that are coming in through my ear at the same time? I'm not focusing on that. So after a while, this kind of practice gets a bit confusing, because you're not quite sure, well, which thing am I actually doing? Am I hearing sounds, or am I chewing my food, or am I tasting my food, or am I feeling the pressure of the seat? So this first stage of mindfulness is only to tie your attention down and stop your mind from bouncing here and there too much. The second level is when you can maintain mindfulness during whatever it is that you are doing. And that's different. You're not being mindful of the thing you are doing. You are being mindful despite the thing that you are doing. So whether you are walking, whether you are sitting, wherever it is that your attention is being drawn, you are not allowing your mind to be fully absorbed into it. So if you're eating, you don't get lost and caught up in that greediness, in that eating. And If you are walking, you're not getting lost or caught up in just the walking. I mean, when you're walking to the sky train, there's a whole cascade of experiences coming at you. Why pick out the attention of the feet on the ground as opposed to all the other parts of your experience? So instead of pushing your attention into that one thing that you are doing, you're opening your attention up and being aware of everything as it is happening. And that's uh, stage two, mindfulness. And stage three, mindfulness, is when the mindfulness is there, irrespective of whatever is going on. You've turned your attention away from all the things that arise and cease, and mindfulness is just with mindfulness. It might be helpful to reflect on the original Pali word for mindfulness, which was sati sampajanya. And sati means to recollect. So if I ask you your mother's maiden name or your address where you lived when you were 10 years old, can you remember it? That's recollection. Memory means that it's in your memory somewhere and may or may not affect you in different ways. 
Recollection means you are calling it up into the mind. Sati means specifically recollection, recalling something up into the mind. In psychology we'd call this declarative memory. And sampajanya is the feeling of your own awareness. Now the feeling of your own awareness is not something that you are normally calling into your attention. Yes, you always have awareness, but you are not always calling that awareness into your attention. In the same way, there is a feeling in your left thumb right now. Can you feel it? You might need to wiggle it a bit, then you can feel it. So what's happening? Well, that feeling was there, but was not in your conscious awareness. So recollection means you're pulling something into conscious awareness. So within all of your experiences, every experience is this quality of awareness, but you are not normally calling it into attention. So you put these two words together, sati and sambhajanya. Sati is to call into mind and sambhajanya is that feeling of awareness that is there with every mind state. That then is your meditation object. You don't need the breathing, you don't need the feet, you don't need the footsteps. The mind has come together. It's very whole, very neat, very steady and purified. Remember what I said earlier, purified doesn't mean that you never have impure or angry or thoughts or of any kind. Purification means that in that second you are not being pulled around by greed, hatred or delusion. That's the purification of the mind. So sati sambhajanya is the third stage of mindfulness, it means you just be mindful, you just know that you are recollected is enough, irrespective of the stuff that's going on, irrespective of eating or drinking or walking or doing different things. So that mind state is very empty. Actually the mind will carry on working, just you no need to pay attention to it. But as you absorb into this recollection, the, just the bright clear awareness, what the experience is, is the mind comes together. That's why I really like the word recollection, because it has this idea of collecting together and recollecting together. It means that's how it was originally. You just kind of got scattered and now you've collected it back together. When the mind coalesces, actually, and is self-aware, it's aware of its own self, when it coalesces, it absolutely doesn't need any other thing. This is where we start to really understand things in Dhamma, like desire causes suffering. Well, desire is a shaking of this. It's a pulling of it. It's a pulling of the heart, the mind, the attention, the obsession in one direction or another, to the exclusion of all other things. And that's a kind of suffering. When the mind is coalesced, it's not moving, it's not suffering. It's just bright, it's just clear, and it's just aware. But you know what happens when you, that happens to the mind? Immediately, guess who appears? The commentator. Oh, I'm really doing it now, that's it. I'm, he's just appeared again, trying to claim ownership of everything that happens. And actually you saw that state of mind because that commentator was long gone. Because you weren't paying attention to him. So then you're shaken out of that coalesced mind again. But if you start to get some of these experiences, then it will get into your heart. And for many people this is the case because it's what we call seeing Dhamma. And if you've seen Dhamma, there's not much you can do to get away from it. It's always going to be there in your mind. This is why they say in some schools in Tibetan Buddhism, they say if you've ever seen a Buddhist scripture, you are guaranteed to become a Buddha. So I have a friend and he actually wears the little piece of scripture in a, in a pendant outside of his shirt. So as he's walking down the street, thousands of people will see it, and now they're all guaranteed perfect enlightenment. 
My reaction was quite obvious. I said, let me see it. <laughs> it was the same with the Lotus Sutra. It's the Lotus Sutra said, anybody who has heard even one word of the Lotus Sutra, guaranteed to become a Buddha. So, one of the words in the Lotus Sutra is the word Lotus. So now you're all guaranteed. Yep. Thank you very much. You can pay your fee on the way out. I've guaranteed you perfect enlightenment. So, what these kind of stories and traditions mean is that if you have seen Dhamma, it will lodge in your mind. And no matter what you do or how hard you try, you're never really going to get away from it. And that's for most of you here have kind of had that, heard that little voice, that little siren song that lodges in you. The Buddha had this little story for it. He said it's like a ship out on the sea and on the ships they would carry a cage of birds and whenever they lose sight of land they release a bird and as the bird flies up it will fly off in the direction of land and that's how they know which direction to take the ship. If the bird doesn't see land it will land back on the ship. And he said, in exactly the same way, those of you who have heard my teaching, but you have wandered off to do other things, you will always keep landing back on the ship until you find dry land. So, I think that's uh, seeing Dhamma or hearing Dhamma means that it's lodged in there. And one way or another, you will keep coming back to it. Keep coming back to the practice. This is one reason why I'm not so keen on meditation methods per se. I don't think there's a set method that you have to do A, B and C. I think as long as you keep in it, you keep paying attention, worshipping, cherishing that little part of the mind, then you'll keep coming back to Dhamma. Okay, that's the three kind, three levels of mindfulness. One is being mindful of what you're doing. Second is being mindful despite what you're doing. And the third is being recollected, independent, what you're doing or not doing is not relevant. But be clear that there are certain things that you can do. And this guarding of the mind is one of them. I don't really like doing quotations because it, I find it always boring when people read from books, but I'm going to end on a quotation anyway. Wish I had my glasses. Quivering and quavering and hard to guard, hard to hold in check is this mind. But the sage, he makes it straight, just like the fletcher makes straight the shafts of the arrow. Like a fish pulled from its home in the water and thrown onto the land, this mind flips and flaps about to escape from Mara's sway. Hard to hold down, nimble, alighting wherever it likes, is this mind. The taming of this mind is good. The mind well tamed brings ease. Hard to see, very, very subtle, alighting wherever it likes, is this mind. And yet the wise should guard it. The mind protected brings ease. Wandering far, going alone, bodiless, lying in a cave, the mind. Those who restrain it from Mara's bonds, they will be freed. So I'm going to leave you with those thoughts for this year. Hoping that if something has gone in, something is lodged, then one way or another, you keep coming back to Dalman.